This summer, while the Garden Club was building the meadow uh, back behind the Francis Wyman School, they dug up some uh, old farm, rusty, moldy, broken pieces of equipment. And they got that from the soil that runs along the back of the school where there's a stone wall. So a few weeks ago when I started developing this, this uh, historic session, I mentioned to some people about the finding of the, the farm pieces and the stone wall and I got a couple of reactions. Uh, the first one, which really surprised me, is that uh, one lady actually said, we had farms in Burlington? That set me back. But then the other one was about the comments and the questions concerning stone walls. So I thought, instead of just talking about this one piece of equipment, we should probably spend a little time talking about Burlington's history and stone walls. And by stone walls, I don't mean this that was built back uh, 65 years ago, I'm talking about stone walls that were built 300 years ago. Many people, I wonder, drive up and down Bedford Street every day, uh, walk the sidewalk and never even notice that there's a 300 year old stone wall right here on Bedford Street. This thing was built over 300 years ago. Corner of Bedford Street, and then right up following uh, southwest, or southeast rather, toward the Francis Wyman School. And it looks pretty low and it looks pretty haphazard, like these rocks have all fallen off and everything. But this is the way the, the, the wall was made and built 300 years ago. Nothing's changed here. These rocks didn't move. What's happened is all of the uh, dead leaves and plant matter over the years has died and fallen down and is built up along the, the wall. So the wall might have been a little bit longer a few uh, 100, 200 years ago, but the, walk, the wall itself has not changed. The story of walls in New England uh, goes back to the Pilgrim, not the Pilgrim, but the Puritans, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. When they first arrived here in the 1600s, they quickly realized that in order for a farmer to sustain himself and his family, they needed a minimum of 100 acres of land. That's 2,000 square feet by 2,000 square feet. It's a big parcel of land. And that land was completely forested. It was so forested, the trees were so plentiful that you couldn't see the forest when you were in amongst the trees. And that's where the expression, you can't see the forest where the trees came from. So anyway, you're a person arriving from England in the city of Boston. You get off the boat. You walk all the way along the, the neck to Dorchester Heights, around the bend, cross over the bridge into Harvard, and then walk back toward Charlestown. When you get to Charlestown, you report, hey, welcome Mr. Coppola to the colonies. Come on in, we're gonna show you on the map how to get to your plot, your 100 acres. They pull out the map and they show you and they say, what you do from here is you just follow the old Concord Trading Post Road, the Post Road. And it's going to take you all the way into the suburb of Woburn. And once you get to Woburn, you transition onto the Bedford Road. And you follow the Bedford Road until you get to Vine Brook and you're home. Your plot is cornered by the Vine Brook and the Bedford Road, your 100 acres. You get there and they give you a cow, 30 sheep, some hens and pigs, the metal heads of tools, you have to make the handles, and that's about it. If you're fortunate when you get there and you can take a couple of trees down, you build a shelter. 
once you have the shelter down, if you have a keg of wine, I mean, I'm sorry, a keg of rum, you can invite your neighbors over to a tree chopping bee where they all come, all the able-bodied men come with their, with their sons and they chop down the trees and the boys chop the branches off the trees and they clear a field for you. So by that time, after a couple of years, your yard looks something like this. You have your shelter, which is a log cabin, and in the field are the tree stumps. And that's like that for about five years. So as you're working the field, you're also looking at all these rocks. And you need to get the rocks off the field. So you need to pull them off. And the way you do that is by using a sledge. The sledge is nothing like a, but a dog sled with wide runners and it was close to the ground. The reason it was close to the ground is the wheeled vehicle are too higher off the ground and makes it inconveniently high for lifting loads into and it does tip over easily. So you need it to be down low and they use the sledge. And the sledge was pulled by an ox. The larger rocks, this is a miniature now, but they had a double hook cast iron bar that was hooked onto the rock attached to the ox and then pulled over to the side of the field where it was dumped in a row along the side of the field and that's how this wall was created it has nothing to do with the property line it has everything to do with the edge of the field and that worked well for hundreds of years. After about 10 years, the um, field was completely clear of rocks and tree stumps. And by the time of the Revolutionary War, it looked something like this. This is a scene from the uh, HBO movie on uh, John, John Adams. So now it's all clear. That field along with the rest of the farmer's land is where his animals grazed. The cows and the sheep, they had free reign all over his property and he didn't worry and his neighbors didn't worry because they had a hundred acres each for their animals to graze. But that began to change following the Revolutionary War. This is another 300 year old stone wall. It's on the other side of Bedford Street and it runs from Bedford Street all the way to Crowley and it's the property line between the houses on College and the houses on Garrity Road. Following the American Revolution, the United States was able to stop manufacturing goods at home. That meant that there were things like the wool mills where they were making material and, and clothing and things like that. So people began to leave the farms. And there was no longer a need for a sustainment farm because the few remaining people who lived there only had to grow a little food for themselves and the rest was sold to the market. So we came from being a sustainment farm to a market farm during the early 1700s. What also occurred is that uh, family members leaving, the farm owner dying, the oldest son took over the farm, but maybe one of the other siblings wanted some farmland, or maybe somebody wanted to purchase some farmland. So the easiest way to divide the property was to simply say, you get everything east of the stone wall or north of the stone wall. So the stone wall went from being the thing that, that uh, defined the growing field to the property line of two different fields, two different farms. With the farms getting smaller and the population increasing, the number of cows in the town increased. 
So in the old days, when you could have the people who lived in the center of a town could take their cows and just let them graze on the common, that's what the, the common good, now the cows were everywhere. And it was easy for a cow to cross over into somebody else's property. And that created problems. So by the middle of the 1700s, the stone walls had to become a little bit more robust and they started to put more fencing in. It was not a big deal to have a brother's car go into a, another family member's farm. It was a big deal to have a non-family member's cow come in and damage your corn or your wheat or whatever. So now we're talking about monetary uh, measures that had to take place to take care of the farmer who lost his, his uh, market goods. But then an argument began to occur. Well, my cow didn't break your fence. Your fence wasn't strong enough to keep my cow out. No, your cow broke my fence and you have to pay for repairs. Well, this got into become such a bad problem that towns would hire another town member to go walk the fence to determine whether or not the cow broke the fence or the farmer did a poor job of building the fence. That became a full-time job of them looking now at shelters and barns and other things that could be safety issues. It grew into what we now know as the building inspector. So now we have these property lines and that's another myth that's exploded. The farmers didn't originally put the stone wall on top of the property line and therefore that's why their dead nuts online would be a time before GPS. It was just the opposite. The stone wall was already here and it became the property line and that's why they're so accurate. And even as late as 1956, when this subdivision was built, the surveyors used the stone wall to mark not just the length of the property, but also the individual property markers. In this case, they chiseled a mark right here on top of the rock. So this is the intersection of two properties. Hopefully you understand now a little bit about our farm history. We started out as a sustainment farm. That meant everything you ate, everything you wore, you grew on the farm. Then we changed over to a market economy, which meant that you grew some food for yourself, you sold the rest for profit so that you now had money to purchase goods. And we continued that way up until the Second World War when we started to transition from being a farm town to a residential community. So now let's get back to this piece of moldy, rusty, broken metal. This was found along the stone wall behind the Francis Wyman School. That side of the land was the Francis Wyman School was owned by uh, the Simons family, Nathan Simon. Uh, Nathaniel Simon, who passed away in 1855. If you look at it this way, you might be able to recognize it a little bit better. It's a sickle. And it lines up perfectly. Let's do it the other way. It lines up perfectly as a sickle. And it was used by the farmers right from the beginning to cut hay, cut the, the linseed, the uh, flaxseed, all the way up to present day. This particular one that we found pretty much matches this one right here. It looks just like that. This was found at the Grandview Farm, the Simons Farm. Before you think that's an old time thing, somebody just 
leaving a piece of farm equipment in the field and forgetting about it. Um, this was also found in a pile of compost that was donated this year. So this would have been buried maybe for 100 years. And maybe that's what we'll do. We'll go bury it out back over to Francis Wyman for somebody else to discover in 100 years or so. If you'd like to see these sickles, we do have a collection at the museum and you're welcome to come and view them.